Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the Folk Theorem. Recapping what we've learned in the last few lectures on the Infinite Horizon Prisoner's Dilemma, we found out that Grim Trigger is a subgame perfect equilibrium for sufficiently high discount factors. Regardless of the discount factors, Always Defect is a subgame perfect equilibrium. And we found out that Tit for Tat is not a subgame perfect equilibrium, at least outside of that one knife edge condition. A natural question then to ask is whether we're done finding all subgame perfect equilibria. Are there any other subgame perfect equilibria out there, or is it just Grim Trigger and Always Defect? That's what this lecture is going to address, but rather than talk about just the prisoner's dilemma, just that infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, we're going to talk about this very generally. That's what the Folk Theorem is designed to do. Folk Theorem tells us something about the equilibria of infinitely repeated games. Specifically, the Folk Theorem tells us that the set of equilibria in infinitely repeated games is gigantic. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about exactly what I mean by that, but as some background on the Folk Theorem, it's called the Folk Theorem because a lot of different individuals realize that there is this property of infinitely repeated games that allows for a large set of equilibria. So we can't attribute to just one person like Nash Equilibrium. John Nash figured out that solution concept, which is why we call it Nash Equilibrium. With the Folk Theorem, a bunch of different people figured it out about the same time. It's in the folklore of game theory, so it's called the Folk Theorem. And it's actually a whole bunch of different theorems, all regarding the different equilibria in infinitely repeated games. Whether you have different discount factors, how you're having time preferences over each stage of the game, whether you care about Nash equilibria or subgame perfect equilibria, tons of different folk theorem out there to address each and every one of those different situations. I'm only going to present a single folk theorem today. It's a rather simple folk theorem, but it has a relatively easy proof to understand, and it does tell you a lot about the size of the equilibrium set for these games. So here is a folk theorem for you. Let's start out by taking a Nash equilibrium from a stage game. So we have a stage game that is going to be infinitely repeated over time. And we're going to have discount factors here, so we are discounting the future, but we're playing this single game every single period over time. And this game is going to be a finite game, so it has a Nash equilibrium. It's a finite game in the stage, but it's infinitely repeated. It has a Nash equilibrium, and we're going to think about one of those Nash equilibria. You think about all the different Nash equilibria of the game, but for now, let's just think about one of them. Now that we have a particular Nash equilibrium of the stage game in mind, let's put that aside for a moment and now think about some other set of strategies for all the players involved, such that the strategies of this alternative set generate an expected utility for all players that is strictly greater than the Nash equilibrium payoff for the stage game. So if we're thinking back to our lecture on Grim Trigger, Grim Trigger has both players cooperate. Mutual cooperation in a prisoner's dilemma pays better to both of those players, a strictly greater amount to both of those players, as compared to the Nash equilibrium of the stage prisoner's dilemma game, which is mutual defection. So Grim Trigger is an example of this. What this particular folk theorem tells us is that if delta, the discount factor, is sufficiently high, a subgame perfect equilibrium exists in which the players use those alternative strategies on the equilibrium path. So rather than play the Nash equilibrium, they play whatever set of strategies that you came up with as long as those strategies are generating a strictly greater payoff for all players involved. And the why is pretty simple, especially if you really understand what was going on with Grim Trigger from many lectures ago. It's a simple generalization, in fact, of Grim Trigger. So if we're thinking about why this is an equilibrium, we know that the punishment stage of the equilibrium that we can construct is for the individuals to play the Nash equilibrium forever. So if we violate the agreement that we've come up with to play these alternative strategies that are not the Nash equilibrium, if anyone ever breaks that, then we shift to playing the Nash equilibrium forever. And we know that Nash equilibria played in every single stage is a subgame perfect equilibrium. So we know the threat to revert to that 
is in fact credible. So when you're playing these strategies, you start out by selecting the alternative strategy set, not the Nash equilibrium set, but the alternative strategy set, and then you revert back to the punishment phase, which is the Nash equilibrium of the game in every stage, if anyone ever deviates from the rule to play the alternative. And there's going to be no profitable deviation as long as delta is sufficiently great. In fact, these utility calculations work out to be very much like a Grim Trigger because Grim Trigger is, in fact, a special case of what I'm talking about here. So you can actually see this by looking at the calculation on your screen right now. Think about the utility for the alternative set of strategies for a particular individual. If we follow the alternative set of strategies and we play that in every single period, then the sum utility for the player is going to be the utility for that alternative set of strategies divided by one minus the discount factor. That's like getting the alternative set of strategy payoff today, tomorrow, the day after that, forever. And you're willing to continue getting that payoff as long as your payoff for a one-shot deviation and getting some sort of maximum deviation payoff. So think about what the other person is doing or the other people in the game are doing. And if you were to break the rule, instead of playing the alternative strategies, if you were to deviate and get some other payoff, what's the maximum payoff? What's the best you can do by deviating for that one period? And then for the rest of time, you shift back to the Nash equilibrium payoffs. So we have tomorrow you getting the Nash equilibrium payoff, the day after that, the day after that, and so forth. And so that works out to being delta times that utility for the Nash equilibrium divided by one minus the discount factor. And as long as this inequality holds for everyone, then you can get the alternative strategies to be played in equilibrium. Now just to illustrate exactly what I'm talking about here with these utilities for the alternative outcome, for the maximum deviation, for the Nash equilibrium, if we were to look at this for Grim Trigger, it would look like this. The Nash equilibrium of the stage game, the prisoner's dilemma, is mutual defection. The alternative strategies that we constructed with Grim Trigger is mutual cooperation. So we see that mutual cooperation is giving both players a greater payoff than the Nash equilibrium. And the maximum deviation, at least for player one, if player two is going to be cooperating according to the alternative set of strategies, the best thing that player one can do if he is going to deviate would be to get a four for the payoff for the period. But what this folk theorem is telling us is that it doesn't have to be mutual cooperation as this alternative strategy. It could instead be, I cooperate in every single period, and you cooperate 95% of the time and defect 5% of the time. If you work out the expected utility calculations for both of us, both of us are going to have a payoff that is greater in expectation than the Nash equilibrium payoffs of two. So just because mutual cooperation can occur in an equilibrium under Grim Trigger doesn't mean that that's the only equilibrium that allows us to break from the Nash equilibrium payoffs. If I know that you're going to be defecting 5% of the time, and that's what we've agreed to for whatever reason, then I don't have a profitable deviation under those circumstances because I'm still doing substantially better than I would be if I were to deviate, if I were to break the rule, and go to getting a payoff of 2 in every single stage from now on. And if you work through the calculation that we had on the previous slide, we see that the reason that you need to have this discount factor to be sufficiently high is exactly the sort of intuition that we covered in the Grim Trigger Strategy lecture. It's because if you get a single payoff that's going to be greater today and a payoff that's worse in the future as compared to the alternative strategy, well, in order for you to not want to take that extra jump in your payoff today, it needs to be the case that you're discounting the future sufficiently much. In other words, you care a lot about today as compared to uh, tomorrow. On the flip side, if you care a lot about tomorrow and the future, you're unwilling to have a higher payoff today if it means sacrificing greater payoffs in future stages. And if you work through the algebra, you eventually get... A statement here which gives you the cut point this discount factor needs to be at least as great as what the fraction reads on your screen right there and in fact if you plug in the grim trigger payoffs from the infinite infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma you actually get the cut point that appeared in the grim trigger video
So what this is saying is that this mutual cooperation that we saw in Grim Trigger is just one alternative set of strategies that gets us out of mutual defection. It's not the only one. There could be a whole bunch more. In fact, there are a whole bunch more. Any such alternative strategy that yields a strictly greater payoff for both players qualifies as long as Delta is sufficiently large. And Delta, if it gets close to one, it is going to be sufficiently large. You're good to go. So, in fact, the equilibrium set is quite large. There are infinitely many equilibria to these infinitely repeated games, whether we're talking about a Prisoner's Dilemma or some other game out there, as long as we can develop some other alternative strategies that yield a strictly greater payoff for both sides. So that is the cool result about Folk Theorem. Folk Theorem is telling us that the, uh, the equilibrium set of these infinitely repeated games is much larger than you might have anticipated, at least initially. So from an equilibrium perspective, this is really neat. But what we're going to be seeing in the next lecture is that from a social science perspective, Folk Theorem is actually really horrible for us. So I hope you enjoy this, and I hope to see you next time when I talk about why it's so bad. Take care.